Continuing on with the question, is Jesus Christ the only begotten virgin-born Son of God? We discussed extensively about the virgin birth. There we go. It's starting to warm up. What did... And uh, last week we, start, we fo began focusing on the only begotten aspect of that question. As soon as this thing pops up. There we go. Okay. Is Jesus the only begotten virgin born son of God? Of course, the term uh, only begotten is what we're focusing on. The... Uh, term that's used in John 3.16, particularly in other, other, script, other scriptures regarding that, is, the, is monogone. There's the uh, uh, transliteration, and there's the actual Greek word monogone. The only, it's translated in the King James Version as only begotten. The American Standard is the only begotten. The New King James Version only begotten. It's only the modern versions that, that uh, leave out begotten aspect, just say the only Son of God. And last week we just were discussing um, who Jesus is, what the Bible reveals to us about who Jesus is. Of course, we learned that Jesus is God. He's eternal. And that uh, um, um, uh, he has no beginning, of course. He's from even before the beginning. And that he is not... As we think of begotten, he's not begotten, we'll discuss this in a moment, he's not begotten in the sense that, that uh, he's born like we are born, whereas we have a father and a mother, and it's at that conception that we are created, our, our physical being and our spiritual being are created, and we have a point in time where we're beginning. Jesus is not like that. Okay? The, we'll discuss that the relationship of the father to the son, son to the father, is uh, not like as we think of in the physical sense. Now, th today I'm going to look at uh, sons of God and the Son of God. There's a distinction. Of course, Christians are sons of God. And then Jesus is the only one that's referred to as the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. You, he's uh, unique in every way. He's different from us. We're, no one is like him. Um, and so, as we consider Jesus as the son, the son of God, Peter knows that Jesus is the son of God as he confesses him in Matthew 16, 16, as when he, when he asked, who do you think that I am? Jesus asked him, and, Peter, and, and Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Now notice how Jesus responds to this. He said, and Jesus answered and said, unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. My Father. He's referring to his Father in heaven. He's telling that you're blessed, Simon, because you haven't been taught this from, from the world. You learned this from the Father. And he did not rebuke him, say, I'm not the Son of God. He, he agreed. Every aspect of what Peter had said was absolutely right. Jesus is the Son of God. So there is... Uh, a distinction, you know, the definite article sets him apart. The definite article being the, the one and only, versus us as sons of God. Jesus testifies that he is the son of God. He testifies about himself. He is the son of God. In three verses I'd like to look at very quickly. John eight fifty eight. Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Do you know what this has reference to? When he says, I am, before Abraham was, I am, what does he mean? Self-existing? Pre-existing? I am is in the present tense. The verb to be is in the present tense. In the present tense, it's not the present perfect. When we think about something that's perfected comes to an end. It comes to its intended end. So we refer to that as in the sense of present perfect would be when we do something now, and complete the act. But I am is in the, is in the present, uh, just the present tense. So the action is continuing on and on and on. So Jesus is in the process of being, okay? He is, always has been, always will be. Whenever it is the present, Jesus is. So he doesn't have a beginning or an end. Go back to Moses when he approached the, the burning bush. And when God commissioned him to go back to Egypt and confront Pharaoh and say, let my people go, of course, Moses is concerned that they won't believe me. 
who am I going to tell sent me? Who am I going to tell my own Hebrew brethren who sent me? Tell them, I am that I am sent you. I am. God uses this term that, uh, that indicates not a name, but rather his nature. I am that I am. He, I continue to be. He's everlasting. And so Jesus uses this same term. Now, note, what do they do? Then took they up stones to cast at him. Why would they do that? He said, I'm God. He said, I'm God. To them, this was blasphemy. Is it blasphemy if it's truth? No. Yes, yeah, so a lot of people today don't understand that Jesus, they look at Jesus as just another nice guy that went around teaching good, sort of like Gandhi, you know, or, or, or many other religious uh, leaders of the world. Jesus never, he, he said, I'm God. I'm the Son of God. I'm God. And you know what? If it were false, he'd be despicable. If Jesus were not the Son of God, or Jesus was not God, he would be a liar. And he would deserve to be stoned by the, the, by the Jews. But let's look at some other things. As I saw in John 5.17, you've been reading it, right? <laughs> okay, 5.17. But Jesus answered him, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, which isn't true, Jesus did not break the Sabbath, but that was their perception of it, Be, um, but said also that God was his father. What does that mean? Making himself equal with God. So here, previously, he had said, uh, well, actually, later on, he said, I am making himself God. Here he says that God was his father, making himself equal with God, they understood what that meant. They were going to, they were going to, uh, they were going to seek to kill him. Okay. Jesus, once again in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you for my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? You know, I've done a lot of good things. Which of these good things that I've done you're going to stone me for? You know, I showed you these signs, the, you know, these works, they aren't just good deeds. These are healings. These are miracles. I showed you great, you know, great things from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, For good work we stone thee not, but for the blasphemy. And because that thou being a man makest thyself God. Okay. So in all his statements, he's, he's identifying himself as God, equal to God, not, not merely having the nature of God, but himself being God. Of course, we looked at the three different personalities last week, that God the Father, uh, God the Son, who was before he was the Son, was the Word, and the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Three personalities, but yet at one in essence. So all the, all the characteristics of God are found in Christ. All the characteristics of God are found in the Father. And all the characteristics of God are found in the Holy Spirit. But they aren't just merely characteristics. They are God. Okay? And he made that clear to them. Now, we're going to look at this more closely. This is going to mean, mean something here Paul, in a moment. Paul teaches that Jesus is God. Philippians 2.5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, John 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus is God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God with God. Of course not. It's not robbery. When you are God, it's not robbery to identify yourself as God. And it is certainly appropriate for Jesus to reveal himself to the Jews as such. I am. When Jesus said, except, uh, except you believe that I am he, as the King James put, puts it, you shall die in your sins. But that word he is provided by the translators you look at, you'll see, notice, both the King James Version and the American Standard put he in, in italics, indicating that that word was, was not included in the actual text, but was provided to try to clarify things. But I think it, my personal thoughts are, it actually obscures the real meaning of what he was saying. Except you believe that I am, you should die in your sins. Except you believe I'm God. That great confession that, that Paul made, or Peter made, pardon me, to Jesus, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. When we confess that Jesus is the Son of God, we aren't just saying 
he is a, 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 a descendant of God, we're saying he is God. He's not just equal to God, he is God. Okay, so Paul teaches that he is God, but what did he do? That he being, him equal, being equal to God, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So God incarnate, Jesus, the second member of the Godhead, who was the Word, became a man, but not, not relinquishing his um, divine nature. He was still God, but he was dwelling in a, in a man's body, fully God and fully man. Okay. Oops, let me go that again. Okay. So Jesus is the Son of God, as revealed in other scriptures. But in what way? What do we mean when he's the Son of God? Do we mean he's the progeny of God? He's the offspring of God? Do we mean that he's a descendant of God? Son of can mean offspring of. We see that, you know. Uh, we understand that. In, in the physical realm, we talk about he's the son of such and such. Well, he's the offspring of such. He's, he's uh, the progeny of him. But also, in Scripture, it can also mean of the order of. It can mean of the order of, in this case, of the order of God. Jesus claiming to be the son of God, others uh, claiming him to be the son of God, it can also mean the order of God. Let me show you some scriptures. 1 Kings 20, 35. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor the word of the Lord. Sons of the prophets. Was he actually a descendant of some other prophet? No, he's been, he was of the order of the prophets. He was one among prophets. He was of that uh, group, that class. Okay. Look at uh, Nehemiah 12, 28. And the sons of the singers gathered themselves together. This was in their, after the walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt by Nehemiah, they were going to dedicate the walls. And so they're getting everybody together to do all this. And so the, the singers who had built villages around Jerusalem, they were being gathered together. And as was said, and the sons of the singers gathered themselves together, both out of the plain country and, and round about Jerusalem, and from the villages of Nehapathai. Okay, so the sons of the singers... They are the, 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 the class of the singers. Okay, they are, um, so that sons of the singers meant they were of the order of the singers. Sons of the prophets meant they were of the order of the prophets. And when Jesus claimed to be the son of God, he was not saying that he was the offspring of God nor a descendant of God. You know, John 1.1 1, 1 clarifies this for 1.1 1, 1 and 1.2 clarifies this for us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was not a child of God. The Word was God. Okay. Verse 2, in, 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 what was that verse 2? The same was in the beginning with God. When the beginning came around, Jesus was in, uh, was, had been with God all through this time. I say Jesus, the Word, was with God through all this time. <laughs> in, a, in a accommodative language, of course, there was no time. Now, so, uh, he was not saying he was the offspring of God. He's not a descendant of God. He was not, um, as we look at it as, as a, as a, born a uh, descendant of God, nor a descendant of God, but that he was of the order of God. That is, he was the essence of God, he an equal with God, God himself, and which the Jews clearly understood he was saying. They understood that Jesus was saying he was God, and that's why they wanted to stone him. There was no misunderstanding. And so, but he was not saying, you know, in, in our culture particularly, when we say we're the son of such and such, um, usually we think of a hierarchy of uh, you have the father and then you have the son that's below him, okay? In authority, in type and everything, like uh, nature and all that. But w when we're dealing with particular the Hebrew culture, when you said you were the son of someone, you were making yourself equal to him. Okay. And particularly here as it's used in, in the, as a son of God, he is, he is God. He's equal with God. And the scriptures teach that being found in the form of God, thought it not robbery 
to uh, be called God. And it was, it was completely, it was appropriate for Jesus to say that I am. I am that I, that I am uh, that I am, okay? Except you believe that I am, you should die in your sins. Okay, so Jesus being the Son of God doesn't mean he is a created being. It does not mean that at all. It means he is of the order of God. And uh, I guess I've really honed in on that pretty, <laughs> driven that home pretty hard. Okay. So, Christians are the sons of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Christians are sons of God. In what way? John, 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. I know there's the definite article. We should be called the sons of God. It's in plural, so we're of a class called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew in him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So we are in a general category, category called the sons of God. Not these, these sons, singular, but the sons of God. Okay, so there's a different class. And <clears throat> we are adopted as sons. Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, that's what we try to do. We want to be, we want to be led by the Spirit of God through our study of the Scriptures and, and applying those things through to our life, our, our very behavior. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again, again to fear, speaking of, of the old law of Moses particularly, we're not of the spirit of the old law of Moses, that is bondage, but rather we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We are sons of God. We are children of God. And we don't have the, that, that concept of we're bond servants to God, which the law of Moses was more or less like, but rather being adopted as children by God. We don't have that spirit of, adopt, I mean, of uh, bondage, but spirit of adoption. We're, you think about uh, when, when uh, a couple decide to adopt children, a child. They're very loving. They're very accepting. They're, they're wanting this child in their lives. Okay? That's what they want. And that's the way the Father is. He wants us in his, in his life. In his, uh, uh, he wants to have a relationship with us again, like it was before Adam and Eve sinned. Um, Yes, I do. Okay, because in Genesis, you know, in chapter 6, when it talks about the sons of God and the, the daughters of men, mm -hmm. and some people have argued that the sons of God, they're just talking about angels. Yes. You know? Yeah. And I'm like, that's not what it says. No, it's not. You're right. Absolutely. I didn't think about that point. But yes, even uh, in, in the book of Job, you know, passing ver the opening verses, it talks about the sons of God who would meet with him. Um, but yeah, the, the sons of God who married the daughters of men. All that means was sons of God are those people who uh, um, uh, seek after God. They're righteous. They live pious lives. Um, and, they're, and they're followers of God. Daughters of men are just, the, it refers to uh, women who growing up in this worldly environment, that's, you know, we talked about this morning about their whole focus in, in on what's spiritual and good and, and uh, um, uh, reconciling to God. That's not what their focus is. They're just worldly. And so, as it was in this passage, the sons of God, those men who uh, revered God and, and uh, uh, walked the straight and narrow, they saw that women, the women of the world were beautiful, and so they married them. That's all it means. They were not the beginnings of giants. That's not what it is. Okay. So, the spirit of adoption, the, there is a spirit of adoption that, and of course we know that we are adopted as sons in Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made or born of a woman. Jesus was born physically. Okay. Made under the law, of course under the law of Moses, to redeem them that were under the law, but not just they, but also the Gentiles too. That we might receive the adoption of sons, and because ye are sons, 
God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Once again, co correlating with what the previous verse, that uh, in our obedience to God, we are adopted as sons. We are sons of God. So, so I'm drawing a distinction here between Christ, the only begotten son, and ourselves, believers in Christ and obedient to him, that we have been adopted by the Father as sons. And we do have a new relationship with the Father whereby we cry, Abba. It's a, a, an endearing term, which is very um, intimate. That, you know what, the world doesn't have that relationship. Yes, Tom. Uh-huh. Made? Okay. I think it's Genao. Oh, is that the double in new? Genao? Yeah. Genomai. Okay. Genomai. That's begotten in the flesh. That's not begotten. It's what? Become. Become. Oh. Okay. Um... Okay, right. Um, the same verb in both places. Exactly the same verb. Being made? Okay. Bo yeah. I have read that it, it's, it depends on the usage. Okay, yeah. Um, I think when, when you... When you when he came under the woman and he came under the law. Okay. He came into being, yeah. He came, but he... He was not created. You see, I think there, there is, is the distinction. Yeah, something happened. He wasn't Jesus before he became the son of a, born of a woman, okay? Made of a woman, okay? He wasn't Jesus before he was made out of, under the law. He submitted himself to the law of Moses, okay? Um, Oh, you said, okay, yeah, that's something I added. I, okay, I confess, I added. I didn't put my initials there. You're right. I should have put my initials there. Didn't find it was myself, the editor, <laughs> who put that born. And that... You've got a parallel passage. It's exactly the same verse. Mm hmm Okay. And that's what he did of the woman. It's the same thing that he did Okay. The he did come of the woman. He came out of the woman. He came this way. Okay. He... In the sense of born being, he was delivered from the womb of the woman, is how, how, how I'm intending it right now. Yeah, but that's not what the word means. Okay. Okay. He didn't come from the womb of the woman. It's the same word. Okay. But he was, did come from the womb of Mary. But that's not what it says. Okay. Okay. Yes. But he, all right. But he was, he was made of a woman. Actually, what's the American standard? Born? born? King James says born. King James says born. And um, are you sure? No, I, it's not. Well, New King James are. Okay, New King James says born. The King James says made of a woman. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a number of, I, I said we would get into monogamy. And the, the word mono, monos is, con, is put together with gene, was a derivative of uh, genos, which actually is a derivative of um, genomai. Yeah. And which can mean born, yes. You look, I'll show you. I'll show you the uh, references I have. Yeah, made, as, as Tom was bringing out. Um, I'll sh I have, what I've done on so slides, we'll probably won't get to it today. Huh? But when something's high of a woman, it's well. being born of her. It's still the, right. still saying the same thing. And the, well, we do, want, we do want to keep things accurate with, the, with the language. Under the law, yeah. it's, I mean, it's still the same word. It's what the image is. is okay. It's when I, 
this will, I'll, I'll put this or include this verse. I have put together several different uh, uh, authorities, Greek authorities, and what they say about the various words. I'm going to look at that particularly, for not just from one source, but several. Well, that would be that would be the understanding, the idea that he was made of a woman. In what way? Well, the only way is to come from her through being delivered. Okay. And so, um, and and. Well, this. Yeah. Right. And I think the distinction is he wasn't created. This was not his beginning. Rather, this was uh, he, be, uh, he passed into a different mode of being, I guess you might say, from that of purely spirit to that of a physical ex existence. Um, okay. And I, what I'm trying to distinguish, distinguish here, we and, and our new birth, we'll just look at that more closely later, but uh, we are adopted as sons. We are not natural born sons of God in that sense. Not to say that Jesus is, is naturally born, but there was a point at which he became Jesus. Before, I mean, before he, he pre-existed and then he became Jesus and he was delivered through the agency of a woman with the Holy Spirit falling upon her to conceive. Having predestined us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ, the whole plan of God is predestined. Not that we are individually predestined by name, personally, but rather there are a class of people that have God has predestined that he will save. And that class of people are those that believe on him and obey him. From, from the patriarchal age, through the uh, Mosaic age, and now through the Christian age, those who... Um, were looking forward to that one who would deliver them from their sins and lived by their faith will, are that class of people who have been predestined as adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So the distinction between Jesus is the only, be, only, the only son, the only begotten son, we are adopted. We have a... We, we are made sons differently. We are begotten of God. Okay, we are begotten of God. The Bible says so. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Okay, so we are begotten of God. In what way, though? Is the, is the wicked one By the word. The I'm sorry? Is the wicked one talking about the devil? I think it is. He groweth about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he, whom he may devour. His desire is to see all of us lost, see all of us in hell. We are begotten by the word. We are begotten by God, but we are begotten by the word. Of his own will, speaking of God, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. So we are begotten with the word of truth by God, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So yes, we are begotten of God by the word of truth. It's our new birth. As that's, we'll look at later, that Nicodemus, um, when Jesus told him, except you be born of the water and the spirit, cannot enter the kingdom. You've got to be born again. And gone. The differences between Jesus as the son, the son of God and ourselves as sons, sons of God. Jesus is eternal. We are created. Jesus never sinned and, inherently, and is inherently righteous. 1 Peter 2.22 we have, we have transgressed God's law. Romans 3.23 For all sin comes short of the glory of God. And must be justified, our sins washed away by contacting the blood of Christ. As we see in Acts 22.1 in 1 Peter 2, 24, that they contacted the blood of Christ in their obedience to the gospel in, uh, in being baptized. 
And whereas we are adopted to be sons of God, Galatians 4, 4 and 5, Jesus is likened unto the Father's natural son. I say likened unto. Okay. We know that before he was um, Jesus, he was the word, and he was, he was with God, and he was God. So when we say likened unto, remember we discussed about uh, being uh, sons of the prophets and sons of the singers, the order of, when Jesus being the son of God, he is of the order of God. He was God. He is God. Okay. Um, so whereas we're adopted as children of God, Jesus is naturally the son of God. It's a different relationship. Isn't that right? Is he is different, right? It says the word begotten. Okay. The word you read. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Sure, it's different. So we're focusing on the Okay. Right. right. The difference is between do we disagree that Jesus is eternal? That Jesus is God? No, no, I don't Okay. And do we do we disagree that his being the nature of God, he is God, he is different. But we are, do we disagree that we are not the uh, like Jesus in that respect? Uh huh. But we are different. We are begotten, yes. But in what sense? We are born again, and that's how we become sons of God. Okay. In the broadest sense, you can look at it. All mankind are the children of God. Yeah, sure. He created us all. But then at what point do we become the enemies of God and no longer the sons of God? And that's why we need to be born again because of renewal of our mind. Okay, okay that's the end of my show. <laughs> I'm not um, disagreeing with your theology. Okay. I want you to understand. I'm not disagreeing uh -huh. with your theology. I'm only concerned about importing into Scripture what isn't in that verse. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Uh huh. Forty-five minutes ago, fifty minutes ago, we yes. had somebody up here in front say, "This represents." Yes. God. Right. Okay. I'm not disagreeing with the theology, but the word represents is not there. It says is. Is it the what he was handing them? Was it really literally the blood? His blood? I'm not disagreeing with the okay. theology. Okay. Okay. But. Okay, you, well. Uh, you, you're familiar with figures of speech, aren't you? Of course. of course you are. You have to. I mean, you have to recognize that he's not speaking. This is the blood of the covenant, right? He, we recognize that. Yeah, so as accommodating as it is, when we say this represents, we're making plain. We don't believe. You know why we would say that? That's an interpretation. Why would we say that? Why would we say because merely this represents? Bread bleed. Huh? Because the crackers don't bleed. It's more than that, Tom. Do you know the, the, there is a perverse understanding of the communion that when one partakes of this, it literally turns into the flesh of Christ and it literally turns into the blood of Christ. That's right. You know that. that verse. And that's, no. That's, that's misunderstanding figures of speech. That's a false that's doctrine. Okay, no, I, I'm trying to explain why we would even, even consider using this represents this or that. It's because we know by figures of speech, no, it, it's not a misrepresentation because we are not quoting scripture necessarily. We are representing, we are, we are praying to the Father as we look at this and we're making clear we don't believe that this is literally the blood of Christ. We don't believe that in the least bit. We make it clear by distinguishing our understanding of what Jesus said is a figure of speech and not that it literally turns into the blood of Christ. And that's the only reason we would say it represents. You can read other passages that, that, that clearly show that he means this is not literally my blood. Yeah, well, 
but you, but but you're making issue that what we say is wrong. No, I'm not. I am only distinguishing the interpretation from the quotation. Well, did you misunderstand what he meant? Did he this? No, did you misunderstand what he meant? You, but you don't, you, you think he really meant? Okay. Well, that's, that's the point, is that he's making the distinction that this is not the blood of Christ. Well, it doesn't matter. He's making it clear that we are not drinking the blood of Christ. This is representative of the blood. The blood was shed on the cross. That was 2,000 years ago. And the blood was delivered to the Father 2,000 years ago, about, just, just under and so we don't have access to the literal blood of Christ, but yet as he instituted this, it represented his blood. And Jesus didn't, he didn't pass around his blood today. And so we, we use terms like this represents for the purpose of distinguishing the false doctrine of transubstantiation and the truth of this, is, this signifies the blood of the covenant and signifies his body, which is broken for many. Hmm? Well, well, it sounds it, it, maybe you're not, but you know, in pressing the, this, it sounds like you want us to say this is the blood. Do you think that that uh, it, the scriptures was improperly represented in what he what was said? Oh, I understand what you're. I know that. But do you think that what he said was incorrect? Well, but that's what I'm asking. That was that prayer to the Father. The Father that the Father looked down and say, "You're wrong. You're supposed to say that's the blood." Do you think that that's what really happened? Well, that, okay. <clears throat> well, you know. The, okay. The question is. Yeah. Well, you know, and. and you know, you, you do bring up an important point that if we get too far removed from what the scriptures actually say, false doctrine can arise. You're right. Well, we have to study hmm? to understand yeah. what each thing is saying. But, means. but the scriptures, God doesn't speak double speak. What he says is one thing. And, and so it's up to us to try to understand correctly what he meant. And I don't think that... that that prayer, this represents the blood of Christ, or this represents his body, is inaccurate. I think it's very accurate. It does just represent. It's not the physical blood. And what Jesus said in that particular verse, as it's recorded by Luke, um, it, it's clear it's a figure of speech. And as we relate more specifically as we understand it, and what I can't see that anybody could under, would misunderstand that, uh, that's what he meant. Um, it's just like when I say, if I say Marshall is Chuck, yeah. I mean, they're like the same. Yeah. I'm not, uh, You're not saying he literally is, no, but Ed, he shares the characteristics. And, and you would understand that. Yeah. The, that's, that's a. The, the, and the, and, the, the, and the, Tom agrees. He understands it's a figure of speech. He understands it. You know, it's not. I don't think when they pray, though, that they're actually quoting scripture. They're just. Right. Like said, they're making, right. These are our. Right. And openly that we understand, yeah, like you said, that it's 
Yeah. It's not the actual blood. Christ didn't come and deliver this morning a blood packet. And right. A, yeah, and you know, that's, that's you'll, you'll remember when he taught the, the, the eating his flesh and drinking his blood, some of the Jews looked at it and said, oh, that's, they stopped following it at that because this hard, teaching was too hard. It was, they didn't understand what he was saying. Okay, they took him literally and say, stopped following after him. Now then. Um, and even when they talked, he gave them bread. Mm -hmm. Right. So as, as we consider... Yeah. So as we make our prayers to God, we don't have to quote scripture. He already knows what it says. And I'll tell you the truth. I, would, I think that when somebody prayers, prays that this represents the blood of Christ, it's clearly declaring to all who would not, who would not be taught right that this is not the blood of Christ, but this represents the blood of Christ. And Jesus never said, this is the blood of Christ that, that what I mean is he never meant to say the mean that this is literally my blood, drink it. And, and so, I mean, the fact that we can... the word interpretation. And it's rightly dividing is what's being done. When they say what they say, they're showing that they have rightly divided the word of God and that we understand that this is a figure of speech. That this isn't literally your body and your blood that's become part of us, which is what has been unrightly Mm -hmm. by other people. And it's not a matter of interpretation. It's do we divide the word of God rightly? Right. Have we done the right, have we done justice by what we understand from the word? Because the interpretation comes from God. You know, I, don't, I, I, I cannot stand the word that how, it's how well, you interpret it. It's how you interpret it. Right. It's what it says. That's right. It's, and that's what I was trying to get at is that God doesn't speak double speak. He intended us to understand what he meant. And I think that Jesus knew that. Hmm? It's not how I interpret it. That would be a proper right. interpretation. It's, is it rightly divided? Have we well, rightly understood? You know, it's important to us understand also the doctrine you talk about. The doctrine isn't our doctrine, the doctrine is what's taught in the Bible. And we use reasonable, logical methods to understand what it is. I mean, we use that in language every day. We expect people to understand what we mean. We expect people to understand what we imply to, to properly infer what we mean. Okay? And it's not beyond our expectation because we do it all the time. And it is, so it is with the Bible, which is written in propositional language like we typically use and understand. And so when we discuss this is our doctrine, this is not our doctrine. This is the doctrine that we glean from the scriptures. Okay? This is the doctrine that the doctrine is merely another word for teaching, not dogma, but teaching. Sound doctrine, healthful teaching, that, lead, that which leads us to life and to uh, properly represent the doctrine in other phrases and terms is not inappropriate. So, uh, but but I, uh, there again, as Tom brings out the point that as we look at the words that are used, we have to understand we don't substitute words, but we do have to try to understand what the, what the words mean. And that's, that's the point. Ditto? <laughs> yes, Adam? I'm sorry, I'm... Okay, oh, I put one, didn't I? Yeah, why tarry thou? Yeah. Rise me, baptize, wash away thy sins. Calling upon the name of the Lord. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Okay, and then, and uh, okay. I type in a manual. Yeah, I do, but it, I find it's, it's, it's I've got every, a lot of things packed away. And, uh, but uh, when I type it in, it's, I, I memorize it better. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so as we consider the distinction between Jesus being the Son of God is different than our being the sons of God, being adopted by, as children, okay? And whereas what I'm going toward is, is we're going to address the, the, idea, the, 
the word being used, monogone, particularly in John 3.16 and other verses that John uses, and Hebrews uses as well. And uh, we'll look at that, why it was, why he used the, the term monogone and not mono, um, genomai? Anyway, uh, there's no accident that John used the terms he did. We just need to try to, why would he use that term? What would it mean? And we'll look at that. Uh, yes, we will. I have a lot of boring Greek for you guys. <laughs> so you see, see the arguments, okay? Thanks for your attention. I'm sorry we ran over, but we had a good discussion. I appreciate the, co the comments and questions. Uh, good for lively discussion. And try to come to the understanding of what the truth is. The, uh, one more statement. The life that is not... What? Uh, if we don't, if we don't uh, discern our own lives, question our own lives, it's not worth living. If we don't question our own doctrine, or say our own, if we don't question our understanding of the doctrine, it's, it's, uh, <coughs> we can make mistakes. Okay. And we, the thing is to try to understand so that we can identify the mistakes and correct them or be reassured of what we do understand as the truth. Thanks.